So we have just introduced the notion of a dual formulation for linear models, which relied on a definition of a kernel function. I also said that in this kernel viewpoint we can implicitly work with feature representations which can in principle be infinite dimensional. In this video I'm going to make precise what I mean by this. The main idea behind it is that we will not explicitly define the kernel via the basis functions, but just give a direct definition of this kernel without ever having to talk about the basis functions that may have generated this kernel. This is what is called the kernel trick, and I'll explain it next. Now, the kernel trick works by formulating your optimization problem in such a way that the input vectors xn only enter in the form of scalar products, uh, or when working with basis functions, in the following form. Now, what we then do is we're going to replace all instances of this scalar product xn uh, with some other uh, data point xm with a particular kernel function. So this kernel function is going to replace um, the role of this uh, scalar product and should represent somehow some sort of generalized inner product or some non-linear inner product. So this kernel function then captures all these similarities between all data points and stores them into one big matrix whose elements we can denote with the nm. So all these kernel evaluations, we're going to store them, store in a gram matrix, which is going to be of size n by n. Okay, so that will be this gram matrix, which we will be using uh, later on. Okay, so that is what we do with the kernel trick. We, re we replace all instances of this scalar product or of this feature-based scalar product with some kernel k. And this kernel k uh, then implicitly corresponds to a scalar product in some possibly infinite dimensional feature space. So implicitly it represents this product, but we're not going to write this out. We're just going to say, I have some kernel. I will give some definitions later on, but we, we have some kernel that characterizes this, uh, this scalar product. Now we cannot just pick any kernel k. It has to be a valid kernel. And a valid kernel is a kernel whose gram matrix is a symmetric positive definite uh, for all possible choices of xn. Which essentially means that if I take some vector z, multiply it with k both on the left and the right, where z is this uh, n-dimensional vector, right? Because k uh, was a uh, n by n-dimensional matrix, then this uh, thing should evaluate to some uh, positive uh, number for all possible z. And you can immediately see that if we define our kernel directly via our basis function, so let's say we uh, decide on some basis function, then uh, the kernel uh, that is obtained by k of x, x uh, prime is phi x transpose phi x prime. If I define my kernel in such a way, then it immediately follows that this results in a positive definite uh, gram matrix. Because if I write this out, so for any vector z, k, z, it's given by z transpose. This is my design matrix, design matrix transpose z. Um, this is equal to phi transpose z. And then the transpose of this entire thing, phi transpose z. And this equals the squared norm, which is uh, always bigger or equal than uh, zero. Okay, so if we are working with a particular kernel and we have to show that it is indeed a valid kernel, then we can always try to write it in such a form and then it immediately fo follows that it is indeed a valid kernel. But in some cases it, it can be incredibly difficult to write it in such a form and then we can adopt a different strategy for proving that my kernel is indeed a valid kernel. And I'll do that on the, on the last slide by showing um, which manipulations we can apply to uh, valid kernels to construct new kernels out of the things that we already knew are valid kernels. But we will discuss that later. So for now uh, it's sufficient to know that if I have a kernel of in such a form it is indeed a valid kernel. And that also means that I can uh, formulate this thing, which actually we've called before an equivalent kernel in uh, chapter 3.3, .3, if I recall correctly. Uh, we encountered this particular form where we have this feature vector with a covariance matrix in between. So we are allowed to call this thing a kernel because we are actually able to write it in this particular form. 
uh, in the following way. So we know that this covariance matrix sigma is a positive definite matrix. So we can perform this eigen decomposition. So splitting it into uh, these eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And then we can also take the square root of such uh, a matrix by just taking the square root of this diagonal and then mapping it back to its original form by multiplying it on the left and right with, uh, with my eigenvectors. And because the matrix is uh, positive definite, uh, I can always take the square root of these uh, diagonal uh, eigenvalues. And if I do this, then I can define uh, my new uh, feature vector, let's call it psi of x, by multiplying my original phi of x with the square root of this uh, covariance matrix. So that allows me to write it into the following form. And we just discussed that this is indeed a, a, a valid form for, for a kernel. Okay, and these kernels, we encountered them in video 5.1 and uh, in chapter 3.3 of the book of Bishop when we talked about equivalent kernels, where we showed that in our linear regression case, we can also make our predictions based on linear combination of my data points via such, uh, via such kernels, uh, actually. So this means I can work with a particular basis, so let's say a polynomial basis, so uh, this is x, x squared, x to the power 3, so we have all these polynomials this describes my feature vector uh, phi of x, and this is the corresponding uh, kernel. Here plotted uh, for uh, the zero point relative to all uh, the other data points on my uh, x-axis. And we can do the same for a uh, Gaussian kernel and for, uh, let's say, a sigmoid. So these examples can also be found in the book of Bishop. So each set of basis functions defines a particular kernel. And this kernel then characterizes how I'm going to make predictions based on my original data point. And what you essentially see in all of these kernels is that uh, when points are close to each other, so points close to zero, that's my reference point in this case, then I take on high values and then I move away of it, uh, from it, then these values become lower. So that essentially means that my predictions are going to be dominated uh, by points that are similar to my uh, reference point. Okay, then there is a very important statement to be made about kernels, namely that for every positive definite kernel, there exists some uh, phi vector uh, that describes this kernel. So this means that I can just define some kernel, I only have to show that it is positive definite, and this then in turn implies that I'm implicitly working with uh, some basis functions phi, which in principle can be infinite dimensional. And this is just good to know. It justifies that we can actually do this kernel trick because it means that, well, we can switch to the kernel viewpoint completely and solve our problems with this viewpoint in mind. But that, that also means that implicitly we're solving some original problem where I actually use some uh, feature vectors. And I'll give some examples of kernels in, in the next slide. But the main point is that in general it is difficult to obtain these uh, basis functions explicitly, but that is not a problem because once we have obtained a valid kernel, we do not necessarily have to retrieve the corresponding basis function, we just know that there is some basis function that describes my kernel. Now here's an example of a case where we can actually derive the corresponding basis function of a kernel. So let's say I'm going to define my kernel in the following way. So let's say it's given by a 1 plus the scalar product of these two vectors and then square this whole thing. So that defines a valid kernel. So we can show this by first expanding the scalar product and then expanding the square. So that looks like a 1 plus x1 z1 plus x2 z2 product with itself, so x1, z1, x2, z2. Okay, so and then if I write this one out, so then I have 1 plus 2 times x1, z1 plus 2 times x2, z2, uh, etc. So what I did here, I, I grouped the terms of equal uh, with equal indices, right? Because then I can rewrite it in the form uh, phi x transpose phi uh, of z, where this particular vector is now called phi x and this particular vector is phi of z. You see, we apply the same uh, functional transformations to each of the components in z and x respectively. So the first basis function, so uh, let's say this thing will be my first basis function, so it's always uh, 1. This thing will be my second basis function. So it just takes the first component and multiplies it with the square root of 2 and it goes on. And this is then my uh, sixth basis function, 
um, which really multiplies the first and the second component within my vector and then multiplies it with the square root. Because if I multiply this with this, I get this uh, particular term. Okay, so I just showed that I can make a definition. So here I just defined this polynomial kernel. Uh, then I showed I can rewrite it in this particular form. So this means that uh, my input is uh, two-dimensional. So these x and z factors are two-dimensional and I define a kernel on them. So this just re returns some number which represents maybe a similarity between two data points. Then if I define my kernel as such, then this really implies that implicitly I'm mapping my uh, 2D feature vectors to some six-dimensional feature vector by these uh, phi of x's which I've uh, just derived. So implicitly I will be working with a six-dimensional uh, feature space. But again, I do not have to explicitly compute uh, these products using my basis functions that correspond to my kernel. I can just work with my main definition of the kernel and formulate my entire problem in terms of these kernels. Okay, then here are some, uh, some common choices for kernels. So first of all, we have this generalized polynomial kernel, which we just encountered. Uh, so of this form with some to the power m. Then we have Gaussian kernels or the squared exponential kernels. These, this is really one of the most popular classes of, of kernel functions uh, because they implicitly define an infinite dimensional uh, vector space. Meaning really that the features, the feature vectors that are implicitly used with these kind of kernels um, can be of dimension, uh, actually are infinite dimensional. You can show this. Now in the next lecture, so lecture 12 point uh, something, I'm going to take a closer look at variations of this exponential kernel and show that it is actually a very powerful uh, parameterization of my kernel, which is super flexible and can represent all sorts of uh, functions. Okay, um, but then there's another class of uh, kernels which is worth mentioning and that's the class of radial basis functions. So that's all kernels of the form uh, where I'm not, so my kernel is always a function of two inputs, so an x and an x prime, and my radial basis functions are really just one dimensional functions which take as input the difference vectors um, squared, so the squared distance between my x and my x prime. And with this said, you see that indeed this Gaussian kernel is a radial basis function. And actually this terminology get mixed up quite often, so quite often people say we use radial basis functions, and then really the question is, well, what kind of radial basis function? And then quite often they say, yeah, of course, the Gaussian kernel. Um, so when people talk about radial basis functions, they often refer to uh, the Gaussian kernel. But it generally said a radial basis function is just a kernel of this particular form. And it can be different from, well, the exponential kernel that you see over here. Okay, so these are examples of valid kernels. Uh, but then you can be creative in designing your kernels. Uh, but you have to be aware that this kernel that you design, it needs to be a valid kernel, right? So it uh, should generate positive definite uh, gram matrices. Now, the main point of this slide is to show you that there are plenty of manipulations that you can apply to existing kernels to obtain new kernels. So suppose all these kernels are valid kernels, then I can generate a new valid kernel out of this, for example, by multiplying the kernel with a constant or multiplying this kernel to the left and right with some function, or I can even take the exponential of, 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 of a valid kernel, and that also gives me a new valid kernel. Now, I don't want you to remember all these rules for, for changing uh, kernels or for constructing kernels. I just want you to know that if you have to prove that your kernel is a valid kernel, you can rely on these type of uh, manipulations. And actually, a nice example comes from the book of Bishop, where he basically showed that uh, these Gaussian kernels, so the kernel that is defined by the exponential minus the squared Euclidean distance from point x to x prime. Um, let's just scale it with a 1 over 2. That this can be simply derived, or not necessarily simply, it can be derived from um, a particular kernel, namely the regular scalar product between these two vectors. So really the idea is that we can start off with a kernel which we know is a valid kernel. Uh, we can sum it and multiply it. So we can multiply it and we can uh, sum such kernels uh, in order to obtain this uh, expansion of the square over here. Then we can take the exponential that's also allowed. And so we can apply all these manipulations to turn this core kernel into this particular form. And that 
then also then uh, shows a proof uh, for showing that this kernel actually constitute a, a valid kernel. Okay, but then important to remember here that each of these kernels, which can be very complicated by using all these uh, combination rules, that each of these kernels actually correspond to some implicit feature representation. 